Hi everyone, welcome back to the DevOps Lab. I'm Damien, I'm joined by Laurie. Laurie, what are we talking about? We are talking about a software engineer's guide to DevOps and some cool entry points if you're a developer who wants to see what they do already reflected in the DevOps arena. Very useful stuff, don't miss it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the DevOps Lab. I'm Damian Brady and I'm joined by Laurie Bath. Laurie, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, nice to be here. Yeah, we so we're at Kansas City Dev Conference. Yes, we are. Uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the topics that I saw on the agenda, which was yours, which was about a developer's guide to DevOps, is that pretty much this? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, basically, I am a software engineer and for I'm, I work for a consult, consultancy, 10 miles square, mm -hmm. and for about six months I was on a project where I needed to know a lot of DevOps, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a bunch of stuff and I tried to kind of turn it into a one hour crash course for people who might need to do the same. Nice, so that that's something we do on this show is we kind of assume this level of knowledge of, yes, it's DevOps, you all want to know about some of the details with DevOps, but this is something that's happening in more and more companies, right, where yeah. you're a software developer and now or an operations person, and now these are things you need to know as part of your job. So this this entry point of how do I get started and what stuff do I need to know, that's something we haven't really covered a lot. Um, and that's what I found really interesting about this topic. So, so what is your advice, I guess, for software developers getting into DevOps? Yeah, so for me it's kind of um, two pieces. You know, sometimes, yes, you're pushed into, you need to learn DevOps, we don't have anybody, you're a software engineer, or you're the person now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think almost more often, we've kind of renamed our operations teams DevOps and yep. said they're writing infrastructure as code and therefore they're developers and ops. And there's still this wall between developers and the DevOps team. And my take has been, as I've learned more about it, even though I still enjoy being a software engineer and very much consider that my role, mm -hmm. my awareness and knowledge of their goals and what they're trying to accomplish and what tools they're using means I can pass better information to the next gate. I can say things like, okay, I expect this application to see this kind of traffic. I'm gonna need it to talk to this kind of stuff. I have this number of security considerations. I'm worried about downtime for X, Y, Z. All things that matter to them instead of saying, oh yeah, it's got a dependency to the you know node math library or whatever, because yep. they don't care about that. Yep, do yep. they need to know what Elasticsearch version I'm integrating with? Yes, they do. Yes, right. Um, and, uh, and better understanding that can be super helpful, and I think developers in general can start getting more familiarity with what those questions might be, what that relevant information might be, by understanding why DevOps exists, mm -hmm and um, kind of playing with some of the tools and seeing the considerations and the iterations. Yeah, because this is a big part of DevOps, right? Not just, right. I've written the software, now it's somebody else's problem, but right. that ownership all the way into production right. and what's running there. So if, you're, if this is now starting to be part of your job, mm -hmm. what, as a software developer, what are some of the ways that I can, I can learn the tools that I need to learn and the technologies mm -hmm. that I need to learn? Yeah, so one of the things I thought was really interesting is looking at kind of the whole landscape of all the different tools, the you know containers and the virtual machines and the configuration management and the orchestration, all of that, mm -hmm. there's 20 tools in each of those areas. Yeah. Um, but there is a benefit to learning maybe one in each of these areas because the concepts move over. So right. even, yeah. so you don't need to know, for example, how to write a chef recipe if you're not always the person writing the chef recipe, but understanding what goes into a chef recipe and therefore would go into any number of other configuration management tools that your company is using mm -hmm. is very relevant. Yep. Um, and there were there were kind of, um, I mentioned this to you before, yes. there, were, uh, there were a couple of entry points that I found particularly easy to comprehend based on my background as a developer. Okay. Um, the first one is kind of the more obvious one, and that's the infrastructure as code idea. Yeah. Um, there is an NPM package called serverless. I know there's a bunch of things that do serverless, and they call them SAM and whatever. Mm -hmm. There is an NPM package that is actually called serverless, yep. and they have a GitHub repository, 
and they have the most extensive examples folder I've ever seen in my life. Right. And you can pick whatever programming language you use. Most modern programming languages are in there. I think they've got you know Python and Node and Go and Java and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And they have an example of what would be your create, update, delete, list endpoints in an AWS API gateway yep. with whichever version of the AWS databases you might plan on using. Mm -hmm. And there's a CloudFormation template to go with it. And what I like about this example is that it's a one-to-one -one mapping between the create endpoint and the cloud formation configuration that you need for that. Right. And the update endpoint and the cloud configuration template you need for that. And so you can so clearly see the connection between the code you're used to accessing as an API, yes. something we understand as developers, and what it takes to get that launched in production on the cloud. And you can iterate with it because you have this like example template there for you and say, well, what if I tried to do this? What yeah. if I tried to do this? And it's a very safe playground. Um, it doesn't take a lot of setup. It's just a way to kind of understand those considerations and configurations, which is a big, big part yeah. of everything DevOps. Yeah, and it's it's language and terminology and things that you are used to already as a developer. Right. Has that so part. there's no big like, okay, now I need to write YAML. Yes, you do need to write YAML, but you're looking at it as five lines of YAML that are sitting on top of your 50 lines of JavaScript or sure. whatever it is that you're already familiar with. Okay, awesome. We'll, we'll show that, we'll put links in as well yes. for people to get, get hold of. Yes. What else What else was there? You mentioned a couple of other things that, that were handy. Yeah, so the second one is, is a bit more of a pipeline process. Mm -hmm. So for those who aren't familiar, in container land, obviously you have Docker. Yes. Um, and Docker, has created this idea that if you have a Docker file and you build it, you get a Docker image. Yep. And that Docker image can be shared with your team or just your local computer, or it can be shared with everyone. Mm -hmm. Docker Hub is a thing. It's kind of like Git or Nexus in the developer world. Yep. And if you go to Docker Hub, you can find an image for Nginx or Jenkins or Postgres or all these things that you're familiar with. Yep. I liked using Jenkins because it's an interface I see right away and I say, oh, that's a login. I know that Jenkins is live. Sure. Yep. And so I could pull the Docker image. All I needed to know was the name and the tag of the version of it that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I could pull a default Helm template. Yep. And the only thing I had to replace to start was the Docker image I wanted to point to and the tag I wanted to use. I think by default it's running an Nginx example, so technically you don't have to replace anything. Uh -huh. And then if you run Minikube, which I do want to warn people, Minikube and production Kubernetes, not the same, but it's a nice playground and it's good to kind of get used to things and iterate. Mm -hmm. If you run Minikube, which all it takes is the command Minikube start, yep. and you run that Helm template, you have all of a sudden deployed. You, you can dive into the environment you've created, whether you named it or it's one of the like halting hummingbirds or the funny things that it generates for you. Yeah, yeah. You can go and you can log into Jenkins and you can do real things in that Jenkins. You can download Blue Ocean, you can connect to Git, you can make all kinds of other complicated scripts and jobs and whatever. And it's all controlled within this instance of Minikube on your computer. And if you turn off Minikube and you turn it back on, it'll be there again. If you tear down Minikube, it all disappears. Yeah, right. Um, and it's nice to see all of those interactions at such an extensive level. Can look at your configurations, look at your considerations. And what I always liked is at one point I did melt down my Minikube and I lost everything I'd been working on the inside of it except for the couple of things that I had um, connecting to you know some external Git. I didn't have a Git running inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was like, crap. And my, oops, sorry, I shouldn't swear. Um, <laughs> and my coworker looked at me and he was like, so now you think I have a hard job? And I was like, I already knew you had a hard job. Like the idea of deploying the thing that's doing the deployment and all of those twilight zony moments or yeah. something, we don't, we don't consider as developers. Yeah, um, our redundancy issues are threading and asynchronous calls and we don't, there's a lot of things we have to consider, a lot of complicated things in browsers and other stuff, but, but this is a little bit outside our norm. And having that playground for me was such a no risk arena. Yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not committing your machine to constantly having this thing running, but you're getting a nice quick exposure to, these are the tools that need to get used. These are the things I need to get used to. 
Um, and as soon as you're done with it, the whole thing gets torn down. Whole thing gets torn down. And, and for me, I was a scaredy cat. I didn't want to be touching even QA or dev in a real running pipeline quite yet mm. because what if I take a whole thing down? Like there's a joke that you haven't been a developer until you've taken down a, a production. Yeah, but I'm past that point in my career. I don't need to go back to that fear. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I was a little tentative and I liked the idea that there was so much I could do that wouldn't be that taxing on my personal computer, yep. but would give me basically a, a fake version of what the real world looks like. Yeah. Um, and the thing I would caution people about is, obviously I, I mentioned serverless, I mentioned AWS, I mentioned Helm and Kubernetes and Docker and all of those things. Those don't have to be the tools that your company are using mm -hmm. for the concepts that you get familiar with to be relevant. Yes. Um, right. and, and actually, in a lot of those cases, I would you know caution you if you are the one person in your company, that first example you talked about where all of a sudden you need to do DevOps and there's no one, don't go for the latest and greatest thing. Don't go for the thing that everyone's talking about, whether that's containers or Kubernetes or something yeah. else. Start small, only iterate and scale until you see that you need it. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're just deploying a web application, there are things for automation and scalability that'll make your job a lot easier and they don't have to be this whole big giant tool and system. Kind of do it piecemeal and see what your needs are because if you try and bite off everything at the same time, you're, yeah. you're, you're probably going to run out of runway pretty quickly and you're going to yeah. be like, well, nothing works because I tried to do it all at once. Yes, definitely. And that's generally good advice, I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah, in the industry. Awesome. So those, those are two things. that we'll, And we'll put links to those. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that you cover in your session specifically that you would want to do? Um, I make fun of Chef a little bit. Okay. Um, and, and I will I will tell that story here just because it's one of those things that I think um, if once you know it, you know it. Yep. Uh, so I had a friend who was, and she now knows I use this story all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was uh, working with a, well, she was building a product and it was integrating with a very specific Elasticsearch version. Mm -hmm. And an environment had been created with her, for her with that specific Elasticsearch version. Yep. She comes in one morning and it's jumped. And so she spends pretty much all day messing with permissions and versions and getting it back to where it needs to. Yep. She goes home, she goes to sleep, she comes back and it's jumped again. Yeah. So she calls the kind of team that made it and they said, oh, it must be Chef. And she tried to look up what that meant and she found all of this marketing mumbo jumbo and she couldn't figure it out. So she threw her hands up and said, I'm blocked. And so the thing I will say for anyone using Chef and you don't know about it if your company is using it, Chef has a recipe that defines a configuration and it has a running environment. And mm. one of the things you can do is at some time interval, compare one to the other. And if they don't match, the recipe wins. The configuration updates the running environment to match what it's defined to be. Yeah. And that catches a whole lot of people off guard. Yes. The other really hard fought piece of knowledge is that modern uh, OpenShift is running Kubernetes underneath and you can use kubectl commands. That took me about five months until I realized that was a thing. Oh, so, nice. Right? Didn't know that. No one knows this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Little pieces of. Uh, like little, yeah, little, little nuggets things. of like, hey, you'll look really smart if you know this. Yeah. And the other thing I would tell people is um, if you are a DevOps person and you're talking about this stuff, Keep in mind that you have a lot of area specific knowledge and vocabulary. Like, okay, your coworkers may know what Azure is or AWS or Google Cloud, but if you're talking EC2s, they have no idea what that means. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're talking, you know, I mentioned CloudFront and that, and that kind of stuff, if, if you use those terms, please define them and, and please give people the opportunity to figure out what some of these cloud service provider specific tools are, because there are Someone made a periodic table of yeah, all I think of I've them. I've seen that. We'll try and find it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a link to it in oh, my slides, so uh, we we can do that as well. Yeah. But um, it's one of those things that it, it can be so overwhelming, and even when people get a piece of information and they think they start to understand, someone switches and they're talking about a different tool and they're lost again and they throw up their hands and say, yeah. "What do I do?" It's, it's difficult. Yeah, and and if those barriers are such high barriers to, yeah. to surmount, then it feels like it's too much. Yeah. It's difficult to actually get started. That's why you start on the playground, on your own computer. No one can mess with you and confuse you. Yep. 
Awesome. I'll, look, thank you so much for spending yeah. your time as well. Absolutely. Um, and we'll definitely put the, put those links in the show notes, and you've probably seen some during the session as well. So. Yeah, and um, everyone should come to KCDC next year because it's a great time. Yeah, it's a good event. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and uh, remember to join us next time for another DevOps Lab. Thank you.